Welcome back to IGN's History of Awesome, a year-by-year -year breakdown of big events that shape pop culture. Today, we're covering 2006, a great year for gamers everywhere as both the PlayStation 3 and Wii were launched. 2006 also marked the release of The Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion and Gears of War, two games that showed us gamers what next generation truly meant. Over in entertainment land, Daniel Craig proved that James Bond could be blonde in Casino Royale, and Heroes showed television audiences everywhere that superpowers are cool. Everything is awesome, so let's get this discussion started. Hi everybody, welcome to IGN's History of Awesome 2006. I'm your host, Jared Petty, joined by... Terry Schwartz. Vince Ingenito. And Vin uh, Tal Blevins. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So now that you all know who you are, uh, <laughs> who are you again? Vincent J Talbot. There we go. All right. 2006. It was a quiz and we passed it. What's that? It was a quiz and we passed we it. We did pass it. A wonderful year that gave us all kinds of nifty things. This was the year of Heroes. This was the year of Gears of War. This was the year of Casino Royale. But we're going to start with what I like to think of as a tale of two launches. Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> in November of 2006, two major hardware consoles launched back-to-back, uh, -to -back, about one week apart. The first of these launches didn't start off all that well, but turned out to be a good thing in the end. The other one, well, we'll get there. But start with the PlayStation 3 launch, which, let's face it, that first few weeks was a little bit rocky. It's fine. It, it's, it's fine? It's fine. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. It's you like, think? It was only 599 US dollars. Well, that's it was right. fine. People are going to run out by a $600 game machine. Now, the great thing about the PS3 launch is that somehow they managed to turn the thing around. I think it's, it's good to, be, to focus on the positive of what became a fabulous console with a tremendous library of games. But that first few weeks, we were all kind of sitting there with sticker shock, or at least that was my experience. Yeah, and it wasn't just the first couple of weeks uh, after it launched, it was for the months leading up to the launch. Ken Kutaragi was just, it didn't seem like he could go to do a presser without saying something that turned into a meme. I mean, it was just unbelievable, <laughs> you know, uh, like the the whole get a second, getting a second job thing, the 599 US dollars, the E3 presser where, uh, with, uh, you know, massive damage, you know, hit the weak point for oh, yeah. massive damage. The year before, too, and when they announced it was gonna have like six USB ports and three Ethernet yeah. ports and two HDMI ports. You're like, okay, number one, why do I need all those ports? <laughs> Can I get the number, cheaper version without yeah. all number those Number two, ports? It, didn't, it didn't come with <laughs> all this stuff either, yeah. right? Yeah. But in addition to all those ports, it also had the ability to play the video format of the future. Blu-ray. That was Blu-ray, yeah. Uh, which, Blu-ray is pretty groovy. Uh, and at the time, it, we were pretty thankful for it because the launch library was a little thin on this thing, so yeah. a lot of us spent our time watching Spider-Man. Spider right? <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> Why were we watching Spider-Man? Honestly, it was one of the cheapest Blu-ray players that was upgradable the firmware so easily at that time, right? So it was one of the best Blu-ray players that you could get. Mm -hmm. So, you know, honestly, that's really what I did use my machine for was to watch movies. A lot. And, and it was mainly Spider-Man. Sort of and it was a sign of the future, too, because right? that's now we use all our consoles as home entertainment systems. No, it's mm -hmm. true. That was kind of the beginning of that, I feel like, of, of, the, of the video game console truly transforming into the set-top box that goes the living room. Also, another good reason to watch Spider-Man on your PS3 is because <laughs> the literal font from Spider-Man right. was, was what they wrote the PlayStation 3 with. Because this Sony was like, eh, we own the rights to the movie. If people know what it looks like, let's just, instead of take a risk with something new, let's just use something we got already. I liked the console design. I, I thought it was kind of megalithic. You like the, the, big, the, yeah, the George Foreman George, factor? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was just fantastic. It was like, hello, I am out of an Arthur C. Clarke story and I've come into your <laughs> living room. And it was really, really nifty. Was, uh, I just couldn't put anything on top of it, though. Like, I have my, my console stacked usually. And then when I got down, I was like, well, I guess this one kind of lives on a shelf by itself. So Maybe we had this thing. <laughs> we're watching our we're watching our Blu-rays on it, and we're playing Resistance. Resistance, yeah, that's what we're playing. Yeah, on resistance it. Uh, and flow. Yeah, uh, and flow, <laughs> sure, and flow, <laughs> but mostly resistance. But mostly resistance. Uh, and yeah. why are we playing Resistance? Uh, resistance was this really really interesting fusion of it was this amazing historical uh, fiction that uh, it was like an alternate history sci-fi, the likes of which, like honestly, we haven't really. At that point, we, we hadn't really seen much of that in the in the game space. So it was if there's always that one title at launch that kind of shows you the promise of what a system can do, and that's a little bit original, a little bit new. Like Resistance was definitely uh, that thing. And I still Resistance is probably still actually my favorite uh, in that in the series. Like mm. all three of them are very good um, to varying degrees. Some very very split jury on the third one, but the first one had a very interesting color palette that mixed. Kind of like uh, kind of high sci-fi and like sexy sci-fi with uh, with kind of historical fiction. Very uh, very unique blend. 
Now you talk a little bit about that promise, and that's really what makes this launch a good thing. It, mm. it was it, to say rocky is an understatement. Oh. Frankly, there was a time that that a lot of us, I think, wondered if the PlayStation Three was going to make it at all after it's that beginning. It's a little crazy coming off the PS Two being the biggest thing and dominating that previous. Right, and generation. unfortunately, a lesson that never seems to get learned in the video game industry. You know, when when you rise to the top of the mountain, do not swallow the hubris pill. Just right. don't do it. Sony did, and it backfired on them. The Xbox launched at a lower price point. It got more good games quicker, mm -hmm. I think, because it had that, that head start. Well, it had that architecture as yeah. well. The, the, the PlayStation 3 had a very the, new, the cell the processor, cell processor. Right? Mm -hmm. that a lot of developers had to basically relearn what they were doing to write for that platform. Yeah. So that's yeah. why I think it's really interesting when we look now at the PlayStation 4 and the Xbox One, they both went with a pretty standard PC standard style thing. architecture. Mm -hmm. and and oh, go ahead. I was going to say, and honestly, like when you look at the, the games that came out later in the PlayStation 3's life, as some of the in-house uh, studios started really getting their brains around it, the things that thing was capable yep. of. I mean, The Last of Us, you just you just up that thing and it looks like a PS4 game. You yeah. know, it's uh, really incredible what it was capable of, but it just took seven years before anyone was really getting the, even close to the full potential out of it. But when it happened, they ultimately did give us things like The Last of Us or Flower or Journey or insert amazing classic from the last generation sure. here. The PlayStation 3 ended up a tremendous success story, uh, and I'm happy it did. Yeah, I, me too. I really enjoy the PlayStation legacy on that. Now let's talk about a launch that went about as diametrically different. <laughs> if you're going to have a diametric opposition, let's talk about a tiny little console with a funny name, the Wii. Who had a Wii at launch? Anybody? Yeah. Okay, all of us bought one uh, because it cost 69 cents at retail. Basically, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, you could buy like two and a half Wiis for the cost of one PS3. At launch. Yeah, yeah, it launched at 250 US, uh, $250 uh, US. And it, if you could find one. If yes. you, oh, could yeah, you could find one. Yeah, tell thing. us about that, Tal. So yeah, so I remember we waited in line at our local Target, and it actually ended up pretty well because they had a whole ticket system. It wasn't, you know, a lottery. We didn't have to wait until 8 in the morning. It was first come, first serve. You got your ticket, and they were like, we're going to get this many units. You can, here's tickets in case people don't show up. You're going to be in kind of the second round. Uh, was right there in the first round, then showed up the next morning, got mine pretty easily. But I tell you what, once they were gone, they were really hard to find for several weeks afterwards. Oh, yeah. I, I worked at... More than that, even. Oh, like, yeah. It just kept... It just through kept, the holiday yeah, season, yeah. really, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I got up on Christmas morning, and my wife had two little packages under the tree. One was a copy of Twilight Princess. So. Uh, the other was a, co was a Wii Remote. And she's like, so I couldn't get the Wii. Uh, so enjoy staring at these until you find one. And thus began the great Wii quest, which ended on the Target loading dock. Uh, and, uh, uh, and a Fro bar? Yeah. Is that <laughs> no, the same? Yeah. Well, but uh, I, I uh, obtained my Wii and brought it home and plugged Twilight Princess in and was pretty much gone from reality for about a week after. Uh, love that game. Yeah, my, my big thing with the... I was a, a manager at, uh, at, Games, at GameStop at the time. Oh, yeah, and uh, it's I was. Been a fun period for oh. you. It was it was crazy because my uh, my sister who I, I mean I grew up I have an older sister she's nine years older than me I grew up and and as once she had kids she was like no no kids don't go into the room while Uncle Vincent's <laughs> playing those evil video games that's always that's the way it was for the longest time and then when the Wii came out my sister was like hey hey uh how can you get me one of these Wii thingies and I was like. <gasps> What? <laughs> you want your children to have video games, Nicole? Well, the, every, that's why you couldn't find the things. Yeah. Well, Everybody wanted one because there never been anything like it. Nintendo uh, excels at making interesting technology affordable, at least most of the time. Current generation, possibly aside. They found ways to do really interesting things with technology and, and make it just within the reach of, of most people who want to have it. And the Wii was a perfect embodiment of that. So, and, hold, so let me, I just want to jump in on this because so I've been playing video games since the Atari 2600 days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as had, have I. Con had consoles in the house, right, the entire time. Had PCs, big gamer the entire time. The Wii was the first time my mom ever said to me, hey, tell me about that console. Should I get that console? Yep. yep. Turned out, she was like, you know, I, I can play Wii Sports whenever a friend's house, that was fun, but I can watch movies on it too, right? And when I told her that wasn't a possibility, that was the, the deal breaker for her. <laughs> but I was surprised, she actually knew what a console was and kind of wanted, was interested well, in one. Well, it sort First of did the life. unthinkable in creating a video game system that was accessible to 
everyone, and you could just go out and buy a Wii, get Wii Sports on it. You wouldn't have to buy any other launch game, and you would have something that was endless entertainment. Like, I remember I was in college, and we had our rec room, and, you know, you could play table tennis and all that stuff, and they had Wiis set up there with Wii Sports that you would just come and play that, and so I remember doing that. I got there and, and took over those, and everyone was, like, doing all this other stuff, and who are these nerds playing video games? <laughs> but, well, but you totally could, and they fit well next to each other. I think that's the thing. As an outside yeah. observer, right, you instantly understand these kinds of motions, yeah. but mm -hmm. when you see somebody doing this and you're not a gamer, you don't really get it, right? So the Wii really did have that instant recognition of what's going on. And that's why you found it in rec rooms, and you found it in nursing homes, and you found it in churches, and you found it in cafes, and you found it at parties. And the first time I ever played with one, some friends that got one in November at launch, brought a projector over from the school where she worked at and hooked it up in our living room, shot it up on the wall, and we're all four of us in our living room playing tennis, looking like idiots, flailing around like morons, and having the time of our lives. <laughs> and, and, Given that it wasn't an HD system, it probably didn't look that great well, on, but the, at the time, on the projector again, either. But you know, we're used to HD now, but HD televisions had not really... The transition was almost complete, but right. it wasn't yeah. quite complete. They weren't everywhere, and so that yeah. was less of a big deal, especially when the thing launched. As the generation went on, that became a big deal. But I was just like, it's so happy! And a, and a lot of that had to do with Wii Sports. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, for me, I was just I was just happy that I could, uh, because of the virtual console, I could play Musha on something other than my Sega Genesis. Okay, yeah, That's we, all that to we me. have to talk about virtual console for a second because yeah. that was a, a new thing too. Uh, tell us about Virtual Console Vince and what it so was. So it was basically a, a, a multi-emulation platform that was fully licensed and legal and normal. So, and it, it allowed games from the Sega Genesis, from the all eras of the Nintendo uh, development, from the TurboGrafx-16, another system that I love, that um, especially those kinds of games were very difficult to play in any legal fashion. Yeah. And it gave people a way to play some honestly great, wonderful like 8 and 16-bit games that were kind of lost to time if you didn't still have those consoles and couldn't readily h uh, hook them up. It just gave a whole new audience a chance to experience them. And the quality of the emulation on Virtual Console was superb. That's the real yeah. reason I bought a Wii as, as kind of a hardcore gamer, was because it actually had modes built into the hardware that supported native resolutions mm -hmm. right. for the consoles it was emulating. There was no better way to emulate certain systems than the Wii Virtual Console. This day, there's arguably no better way for some of them. And it was, it was great because it gave people, uh, <laughs> not only were those games, some of those games lost to time because of the platform they were on, some of them were just legitimately very, very rare or ga uh, rare, ga rare games that, or games that never came to the States, like uh, like Alien Soldier, you know, yeah. uh, for, uh, by Treasure, you know. Or uh, Dracula X, Rondo of Blood. Yeah, I think <laughs> right, so. right, stuff yeah. like that that people just couldn't experience over here and they had an opportunity to, to do it through that. Final thing with Wii here, in addition to the accessibility, in addition to the low price point, in addition to virtual console and all these other things we've discussed, it also had a really great launch lineup. We talked about Wii Sports mm -hmm. earlier. I mean, anybody could understand it. Uh, what was your favorite Wii Sports game out of the five? I think bowling was the... Golf, bowling, tennis was mine. Golf, oh, bowling, wow. tennis, so three across the panel. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so everybody got a favorite or a couple of favorites. Anybody could pick it up and do it. But in addition to Wii Sports, it also launched with Excite Truck. Marvel Ultimate Alliance, Super Monkey Ball, Super Swing Golf, which is actually a lot of fun, Twilight Princess, which was huge, uh, Trauma Center, WarioWare Smooth Moves, which is still one of my favorite Wii games, uh, and Rayman's Raven Rabbits, which allowed you to throw a cow over your head. <laughs> <laughs> and while that doesn't sound impressive, you know, when you look at any one, you put those together, that might be the best launch lineup uh, in, in American history. Especially since uh, Super Monkey Ball was... That what a hidden gem yeah, that was. I love that game. That 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 spawned a that that's one of the few like sleeper launch titles. Like normally if you played that game at the time, you'd be like, you know what, this is a game that's gonna be good at launch. Yeah. But six months or a year from now, no one's gonna know what this is. Nope. They made many, many, many super monkey balls. They made spin-offs on other platforms because the mechanics were just that good. But let's be honest too, the Wii became the Wii Sports machine. I yeah, mean, I, that's I, eventually what it became in the house. That was the thing that you would boot up. To play Wii Sports. Well, well, I mean, I, the for nunchuck some. and the controller worked so well alongside it. Like, it was a completely new set of mechanics that you had to learn how to use, and it was so intuitive with Wii Sports that it made it really fun to play that way. Yeah, I'm a Wii apologist. I, I love that thing. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll argue the way. Well, so how, how many TVs were broken because of that console? <laughs> Mine was. Uh, <laughs> this is what happens when you invite your youth group from the church over to play Wii. Oh, no, Always wear the strap, Jared. Our Always brand, wear the brand strap. new HD TV. Oh, Got geez. a hole in it. Oh, yep. man. Uh, Moving on from the Wii, we'll take a shift to entertainment for a second now and talk about television and the arrival of 
Hero! <laughs> Wait, that's that's this year, Jared. Uh, no, you? no, no, no. <laughs> the arrival of ahead. the good heroes. Uh, <laughs> now, that first season, I mean, we, we look back and we can say, like, Lost was a huge pop culture turning point. But oh, Heroes, yeah. the first season of Heroes was a huge pop culture turning point because even though, you know, it was not... Uh, an adaptation of anything superhero or comic book, it was a clear, clearly inspired by that. And I think it really set the stage for the complete takeover of television that we have now with, you know, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and Arrow and, and Daredevil and all those things. That first season, you know, I've gone back and revisited it. There are certainly issues with it, but yeah. overall, like, it was really compelling storytelling. And it had just great twists and turns that you would typically only consume in a comic book type setting, uh, but but that translated so well to serialized TV. Yeah. I, I just want to echo what you said. I think it's really interesting that now in 2015 we're at this time where comic book movies are number one in the box office, that we have The Flash, we have Green Arrow, we have Agents of the S.H.I.E.L.D., we have all these comic book shows on TV. It wasn't like that when Heroes came out. No. I mean, there were comic book movies, but it, it was clearly wasn't... a little X-Men inspired. Yeah, yeah. absolutely, but, but it, that really is, I think, what kind of changed pop culture, or one of the reasons why pop culture really changed to be able to see kind of these superheroes as becoming such a big thing, right? Mm. Yeah, and I, I think she mentioned uh, that it, that it was based on on X Men. I think that's really good to point inspired out. You know, it, inspired by X Men. Yeah, well, uh, if you're going to steal, steal from the best. Um, <laughs> but it made it work. Uh, Marvel comics tend to feature kind of lower powered heroes, particularly defensively uh, heroes with a single unique ability. Uh, and uh, the Hero Show followed that line, followed the kind of you know the odd man out situation, people being persecuted for being different, secret histories, heroes and villains with moral ambiguity. Although the, you know one villain, of course, was kind of a psychotic like, maniac and but very Siler lovable. Siler was like but delightful. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Zachary yeah. Quinto, for the yeah. gift you've given. Yeah, Heroes gave us Mr. Spock. That's right. Yes. Uh, you know, That's right. Um, I just think that Heroes is also very significant because even though, you know, I think it's fair to say that especially in its totality when you look at all the se seasons that it ran for, it's not an equal works to the original X-Men film in any way, shape, or form, but I feel like it did for superhero TV shows, what X-Men did for superhero movies mm -hmm. in the modern age, which is that it kind of paved the way, showed what the model for uh, a medium to high budget um, serialized um, yep. you know, comic book TV show for, looks yeah. like. For the time, really good effects for yeah. TV, yeah. especially for a brand new, unproven sure, show. You absolutely. Know? And honestly, to me again, and I'm sure you guys all agree, the first season was by far the best season. Oh, yeah, I, I, yeah. Don't, I don't think we should talk about the other seasons. Let us <laughs> know more of them. Go 2006. <laughs> uh, exactly, yeah. that's the year, but yeah. Save the cheerleader, save the world. Yeah, that was <laughs> so many, yeah. yeah, it was so, so iconic. The hooks were great. The uh, the episode Company Man, where you you, you find out Horn Ring Glasses, who you have believed is the arch villain of the series for 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 half the season, discovered nope, he's the best guy on there, and you had no idea. Being fooled like that and have it having it flipped over on me, I, I just jaw dropping TV at mm -hmm. the time. He's I, not just Dad of the Year; he's Dad of the Forever. Yeah, <laughs> and then you mentioned Siler er, er, earlier. You know, a delightful bad guy, just a, just a hateful, insidious human being, but just so evil, so wonderfully he, evil. He's so well drawn to and, and very well acted by by Zachary Quinto. I think if, when I go back, that's the thing to me that still stands the test of time. Oh, he's the show. show. He's the show. When you yeah. look back, yeah. HRG and 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 and, uh, and Siler are, are the show. Yeah. And the George Takei uh, uh, <laughs> test. Uh, and by the way, that, that was kind of the be beginning of that George Takei resurgence. Like, yeah. the, the, hey, George Takei takes over the internet. Heroes was kind of the herald of that, that, uh, that and then thing. Facebook. Yeah, and then <laughs> Facebook. And uh, then we had him forever. Thank goodness. Uh, casualty of the writer's strike. That's right. Um, the show I bought a TiVo to watch. Uh, <laughs> R.I.P. Heroes. Uh, so sorry it's, to see it's you go. Still on the, it's on the air right now. We should not write it off. Let us speak no more of that. <laughs> Let us speak no more. It it's is reborn. It, it's probably still in your TiVo too, Jared. Yeah, yeah. it's still there. It's waiting. Yeah. I don't waiting think my TiVo you. will plug into my current television. <laughs> I was just going to say, yeah, it's, it's right there on your TiVo, which hopefully is sitting in a garbage dump somewhere. <laughs> Switching back uh, to uh, games for a moment. Let's talk about The Elder Scrolls IV, Oblivion. I mean, uh, if so, we have to. Yeah, if we listen to that. What? <laughs> What's that all about, Can we just Vince? go play instead? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, can we just go play? Be sure to mod it first. Uh, that's it. Oh. Which was one of the most important things about Oblivion. And, you know, coming out on PC, you're just like, wait for the mods, here they come. You know, and, and that was part of the fun. Also, There's also a big ESRB controversy over that. Yeah, tell us more about yeah. that, Tal. So, yeah, so over the mods for, you know, the game released with the T rating, mm -hmm. and then a bunch of mods were released for it. One of the mods that we released was a full frontal nudity mod. 
And the ESRB came back to Bethesda and said, you didn't tell us these textures were in the game. And Bethesda was like, these textures aren't in the game. That's how <laughs> modifications work. work. Yeah. And the ESRB was like, well, we can't have this out there for, for the kids. Who's thinking of the children? You have to raise your game to an M. So they actually had to release stickers that GameStop, you had to put stickers on the boxes for Oblivion because of a modification, something that Bethesda never even had in the game. It wasn't even like hot coffee. Yeah. Wasn't in the game. It was a modder had, had done something. So very, very internet. interesting story at the time. <laughs> well, that, yeah, you know, and it really kind of showed that you know how do you then rate these uh, works of art that aren't necessarily that, that can be modified, right? Or yeah. you can change the works of art. It's just like you know how do you rate online experiences for the ESRB, right? You can't like right. you know nobody intends for there to be all that racism and sexism out there, you know, and you're coming through your ear when you're playing mm -hmm. an online shooter. But you know that's that's the kind of world we live in. That's yeah. absolutely fascinating. It's one of the casualties of of allowing people to go in and express their creativity. Or some of them are going to express it and. Especially creative ways. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and while it's not exactly like the hot coffee situation, uh, logistically it's obviously a very different thing. There's no two ways about it. Like that, the fact that people had that retailers had to add stickers because of GTA certainly paved the way for that for that same kind of decision. That's with, exactly, with it. and I think that's why the ESRB came down on it so harshly. Yeah. was because hot coffee had been you know just just passed. And they sure. wanted to make sure they were still seen as the authority because there was a right. lot of question on, hey, is this governing body, do they really have any power in this industry? Mm. Now, in addition to, you know, we're talking a lot about modding, but this game didn't just come out for PC. No, it uh, didn't. And that was, <laughs> so let's talk about that for a second. With the, with the, what's amazing about, about Elder Scrolls, you know, about Oblivion in particular for me is that I was always primarily more of a console gamer. I've played on PCs since maybe the late 90s. I'm not a stranger to PC gaming, but I didn't always have a PC, uh, a gaming grade PC. And even with games like Grand Theft Auto 3, the previous generation, I had never seen a world as open or as large as Oblivion that I could actually play without having to go and buy a $2,000, you know, or at least I thought $2,000 gaming computer at the time. Um, the first time I was like off the leash in that game and could go anywhere, I just, I, I was, you know, people talk about, I was, yeah, goodbye reality. No, I was literally goodbye reality. I was like, this is just the world I want to live in and, and be in and frolic with unicorns in. <laughs> there was, you know, the, the, you know there was that thing that was that unicorn. You know the unicorn? Yeah, yeah the unicorn. Yeah. So I have a very depressing thing that happened with oh, the unicorn. No. I was, when I first heard about the unicorn, I'm like, I've got to find this unicorn, this, this, this singular, you know, lustrous being. And I did find it. I found it dead in a forest. <laughs> like so many other people had the same problem where they found the unicorn, but the unicorn is dead. That's what, there's one. There's one of the whole game world. Well, what, was Voldemort drinking its blood to stay alive? <laughs> well, that's the thing about me. that game too, right? Things would happen in that game when you weren't even around yeah. and yeah. unfortunately, whether it be a bug or not supposed to happen, but that's just mm -hmm. how the game world was. It was a lot like the real world. If you miss something, too freaking bad. Yeah. And <laughs> that world was the real appeal. Forget that, who cares about the story? I, I mean, oh, yes, the main I, story I, I, on Oblivion, yeah. like I, I was one of those people who didn't even play the main story until I got like super high levels yeah. and then it became really hard all of a sudden just to get through the main story because all the side quests were much more interesting to yeah. me. Like the, the, that's what made the world real, right? You know, really just just happening upon something randomly instead of like following this main story. Yeah, just sort of being this vagrant, wandering around this beautiful, wonderful world and seeing what you could get into. Was also you could become a vampire, and you know that's just always fun. <laughs> but it's really uh, interesting. Like you know, the better our game consoles get, the more and the more capabilities they have, the more we see games like that that you know don't need that straight through line through it. It's just about spending time in this world and then you have more replay value. Well, that's yeah, what I, I always do, right? I load up my game being like, I'm going to finish that quest tonight. And then all of a sudden I get in and I go, ooh, cave door. Ooh, shiny thing. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then I just get lost. And then like eight hours later, I'm like, oh, geez, well, I guess I'll get to that quest sometime. Yeah. <laughs> and Oblivion's a pretty stupendous example of, of that. Uh, shifting gears again, uh, this time back to movies. This was also the year that gave us people who would recite the same annoying jokes for a decade afterward, oh, thanks no. to Borat. <laughs> my wife. Um, yeah, my wife. Uh, just, uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Brian Altano. Um, yeah, uh, so Borat came out, and Borat, uh, kind of a, a really interesting odd man out comedy. Uh, yeah. uh, Terry, you want to take the lead on this? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was sort of unexpected, Right, you know, if we had seen anything like it before, it wasn't quite in this presentation. It wasn't quite as offensive as what Sasha Baron Cohen <laughs> created with this movie. But 
And I don't think they could get away with it today. He's literally had to retire Borat because he's too well known. But at the time he was going around with this character and they were shooting these people and they weren't even telling people that they were in a movie until they saw that it came oh, out. Lots and of lawsuits. Lots of lawsuits. Mm -hmm. They had to change that a lot with Bruno, the next one that he he did like that. And even, you know, the Pamela Anderson stuff in that movie, it's just, it's bananas. But it really was funny and it's it's interesting I think because of all those lawsuits we never saw it become a huge trend beyond what Sasha yeah. Baron Cohen did with it. So yeah. many people claiming you made me look stupid when actually they were kind of making themselves right. look stupid but mm -hmm. it, it does kind of go to this kind of group psychology right that maybe you wouldn't really act like that unless you were kind of egged on and there were you know you hear some of the cases and how they shot it and it was really like a mockumentary and the other players didn't know what was going on was, it, but like you're saying it was very interesting for its time because you probably just couldn't get away with something like that yeah. these it, days it was almost like a almost like a live action Jonathan Swift story uh, <laughs> yeah. there's it, it, it this ridiculous person walking around and you're you're trying to focus on his ridiculousness but you realize quickly that through those interactions he's he's really just Kind of mirroring the idiosity of your own culture and society right back at you. I mean, as as silly as Borat is, we're so much sillier. And, that, and we're in on the joke there too. Yeah. Like we're in on the joke that Borat is not a real person, but seeing these people react to him like he is, it's just I don't know. It's sort of chilling now thinking about it. <laughs> but, but what I like about it is not only are we in on it with him, but we also at least I experience kind of a feeling that I was also complicit. Uh, right. In yeah. this. Right. this, these are we're my people. Yeah. This yeah. is my world. Well, not just his, but. This is my culture that's doing this to him, that's uh -huh. responding this Ooh, way. Right. Um, uh, maybe maybe the joke's on me. Uh, that's how I felt about him. Also, the scene with the naked wrestling has poisoned my mind. I, I cannot <laughs> I help but conflate <laughs> that scene where Borat wrestles naked with the scene in Cronenberg's Eastern Promises <laughs> where Viggo Mortensen is fighting to the death naked in a shower with this other guy and it's like brutal and horrible and there's hard surfaces and cuts and and I always see Sasha Baron Cohen and Viggo Mortensen wrestling naked uh, to the death now. You should, right? you should probably talk to someone about that. It just yeah. conflates in but my also mind. I'd watch that movie. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'd watch yeah. that matchup. Oh, yeah. YouTube, get to work on that. Yeah, <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, but yeah, uh, Borat, uh, he's he's gone now. Um, Sasha Baron Cohen? What? Still around. Still around. Still doing yeah. stuff. Yeah, but he's done so many characters like this. Like you mentioned Bruno. Obviously there was Ali G as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. I mean, he started the out the, the first time, the dictator, yep. the first time I was ever introduced to Sasha Baron Cohen was not, didn't know who the hell he was, but was uh, this internet viral marketing campaign going around uh, Super Greg. Where he was like this Eastern European, uh, you know, it was basically the basis of Ali G, kind of what started, mm -hmm. Eastern European rap star, um, you know, our, our, our beastie boy, a b boy. And uh, I think it was for Lee Jeans back in the 90s, but it was just something that was being passed around the office. And it, like, we were like, what is this? Is this real? Who is this guy? And it's just funny to think that even back in the late 90s, it really was something that he had already been fostering and he kind of has made his career off of just being other people, other Eastern European people. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, heading back into the world of games for a second, uh, in November of 2006, uh, Xbox 360 owners got a delightful uh, new justification for having bought their console, Gears of War. Yeah, Gears of War is really something else because I remember when I first saw footage of the Berserker smashing through a wall during E3 2005, I watched that clip maybe 30, no, I'm not kidding, like 30 times, and I was like, there's no, this no. That's not that's not a video video games that look like that. Mm. That's not that's not possible. <laughs> I'm like if a system can make a video game look like that, I will never need a gaming PC. Is what I said to myself. Then, oh, well, you know, it's funny. Obviously, that didn't work out quite like that. But <laughs> full, full circle, full but, circle. Yeah. But but I will say it was the first time that I felt like uh, consoles could even come close. And then when it was playing it, when I was playing it and it was in front of me, I couldn't believe it was. Real. So the technical prowess was extraordinary, and then you had the mechanical innovation. Uh, Gears of War kind of took what Resident Evil 4 had pioneered. So I would say, yeah, Resident Evil 4 to a degree. I think the real, I think the real predecessor actually is Kill Switch, ah, uh, which kind of started that whole take cover, aim while you're in cover, and mm -hmm. then you can kind of pop out of cover and hit the spot you were aiming at, and that 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 fluidity of um, of like being able to set up your your shots before you leave cover. Uh, I think was the kind of defining thing of, uh, of Gears of War in a lot of ways. How did you guys adapt to that uh, when it came to that switch, to that new kind of gameplay? You know what? I did get a little annoyed that 
one button did multiple things. So you'd be running, sure. running, and then all of a sudden you'd latch to a wall, right? But once you got used to it, uh, you know, when I first jumped in, it was annoying. Once you got used to it, the cover system actually worked pretty well. You just had to know how far you had to be away from certain walls to be able to run past them. It was kind of a meta game into itself, you know? Yeah, uh, negoti negotiating the cover uh, in a lot of ways, some people have compared it to taking a platformer and turning it this way, <laughs> where where suddenly you're you're thinking about um, every every move forward has to be within the safety of those confines, and maybe the maybe the play spaces were a little bit constricted mm -hmm. uh, because of that at first. Um, they, they did manage to open it up in some levels. It felt a little bit narrow, mm -hmm. but uh, the fact that I always had to think about my positioning and my environment, and that was a constant part of the decision making process in a way that it just wasn't in say a game like uh, as much in a game like Halo. Do you know the uh, first playable where it was shown? First publicly playable. I don't. IGN Live. In oh, Anaheim. really? Whoa. Yeah. That's a good Two, website. Nice. 2004, IGN I've Live. I've been to IGN a few times. We, we, <laughs> we had a, an event in Anaheim. We were there, and we had Mark Rain on one of the panels, and, right. and he just he came, up, came up to me after the panel, and he was like, hey, you want to see what we've been working on? I was like, well, yeah. He's like, hey, can we hook it up at this TV here and show people? And it was just ridiculous, because I was like, yeah, of course. And then all these people started <laughs> crowding around, and it ended up being Gears of War, and everybody had never seen this before, and like, what is going on? Like, you know, what is this thing? It was just, it was. They just it was, hooked it up wow. to a TV. Oh, yeah, it was, it was serendipity. That's <laughs> beautiful. Yeah. Okay, we I didn't know that. it was going to happen. He just had it in his, in his bag, and boom, and there it was. And then, of course, all the hype leading up to it, oh, yeah. Microsoft put so much behind it, and Cliff Bozinski was at every stage show that did they did, you yep. know, with his uh, with the chain gun, you know, yep. the chainsaw the gun. Mm -hmm. yep. the I remember Lancer, the, yeah. the TV spots with the kind of the mournful music playing yep. over Mad there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, those, were, were, were those were really Huge well done. They were great, yeah. Beautifully done. Total contrast with the way the game turned out, right? I mean, like, the, the art in the world, I mean, I think their theme was kind of destroyed beauty, which is actually the name of their art book for yeah. uh, for the first game, because everything is like these, like the fall of man, like what, what used to be uh, like the pinnacle of our civilization, like walking through the ruins of that. And that was very powerful in kind of a quiet way, but really it was just like, nice, yeah. <laughs> sweet, <laughs> let me chainsaw someone yeah. in half. You know, Space Marines, <laughs> yeah. nice. But yeah, I think it, you guys uh, should do the marketing game. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a nifty contrast. Uh, and and uh, people, it was, you know, you thought about at the time the amount of money they spent on it seemed ludicrous. Now the budget would be considered quite moderate. Oh yeah, uh, and it but, totally panned out for them. Yeah. It turned, yeah. It turned out okay for Microsoft, I yeah. think, that whole Gears of War thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, moving on to our final big thing of the year. Uh, the name is Bond. James, James Bond. Bond. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and a reboot? <laughs> what? <laughs> so once... Okay, that was awesome. You're welcome. Once upon a time... Movies didn't reboot very often. Series didn't reboot yeah. very often. Games didn't reboot very often. Once upon a time, here we are yeah. in the age of reboots. And now <laughs> every year we're like, who's the next Bond going to be? Exactly. <laughs> now we were used to Bond changing identities, but it was always just one continuity, but not Casino Royale. Terry, can you tell us about how this worked? Yeah, you know, it was just a completely different change of pace from the Pierce Brosnan Bond that we had become used to. He was goofy, he was charming, and then we get Daniel Craig, and people were very upset about Blonde Bond for, for a while yeah. until we finally met him and we were like oh this guy is awesome like he he is is not there to seduce you necessarily he's not there to sweep you off your feet he's there to be a total badass and he was he is he, he's he's bona fide psychopathic i mean yeah. he's terrifying he's the literary bond brought savage. to the screen yeah. if savage. you ever read uh, if you ever read ian fleming's novels yeah savage that's a great mm. word he is that character brought to life on screen which i never ever thought anybody was gonna have the guts to do. And then they're like, you know what? We're gonna restart the story from the beginning. All the other movies never happened. Here he is, James Bond, and he was just tough as nails and terrifying, and I wanna be him. Even, <laughs> even when he wasn't uh, in, engaged in any action, he has this aura of violence mm -hmm. that, that, that was, it was terrifying, but it was also awe-inspiring. Just look at him behind you. I'm yeah. a little scared yeah. already. Yeah. Yeah. How cool he is. He's just right there. And yet but so suave. That opening scene, to me, the parkour scene where they're in the construction yard was amazing. That's one of my favorite Bond opening scenes. Oh, that chase time. sequence. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And then how that ends. Yeah. Just like, no, nope, whatever. I'm going to shoot the guy anyway. Beautiful. And also that that pre credit introduction in the bathroom and where he's sitting and talking yeah, to the guy. That's what I was Both about those are so good. Oh, that parkour scene was amazing. So many memorable. Think about the fight scenes. Just 
visceral. And just well, the look of the movie just the was torture scene. gorgeous. Oh, the, yeah. the torture scene so good. made that me not want to sit down for weeks. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, the torture scene, I was sitting in the theater with my wife, and when Naked Daniel Craig is there, and they cut the bottom out of that chair and loop the rope and whip it up underneath, my wife just goes, <gasps> Oh, like <laughs> you like think how I feel? Yeah, she's like uh, she liked uh, naked Daniel Craig torture. She was okay with that. And, oh, oh, oh you've been, been in another way. Okay. <laughs> What's interesting Ugh. about Casino Royale too is that it was uh, Quantum of Solace, which came after it was like the first di real direct sequel to a Bond movie. Mm -hmm. They mm -hmm. just it worked so well they could continue the story. Is uh, what is your favorite Bond movie? Curious. Oh, hmm. uh, all time. Well, no, no, yeah. no, no. It's like Casino Royale. That's a good question like this on camera. Right, 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 that's, a, a good, that's a good reason to ask that question because I'm like, I don't think I can pull which one it is. Yeah, Casino Royale's mine. Uh -huh. Easy. Uh, it grabbed me. And I, I, I am a Bond movie nut. Um, mm -hmm. But when I saw this, I saw the embodiment. I'd grown up watching all the Bond movies, reading all the Bond books. For the first time, I saw them fused into kind of a perfect, perfect synergy. And I was just like, yep. I've never been happy. It'll be Gold really interesting right to see. So yeah, cool. that's a great one. No, but it'll be interesting to see where it goes from here because, again, there has been talk about who will be the next Bond after Daniel Craig and will they, I guess my question is, will they continue down this path that they've established or will they do a completely, a big tonal change? Yeah, I wonder again. about that. What do you think? Right, because traditionally it's been, like you said, like they were kind of uh, concerned about a blonde bomb Bond or there was a lot of, you know, controversy over yeah. it because it had been brunette men you know who were who were very rugged, ruggedly handsome, mm -hmm. of course. But this was a, a kind of a switch, and then of course all the controversy that came up, you know, over the past couple of months as well, you know, about a potential of a block bond. Yeah. You oh, know. Please make Idris Elba bond. Idris, just make Idris yeah. Elba everything. Yeah. Like yeah. he's awesome. 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 He would be an incredible yeah. bond. Yeah. yeah. I, so I, lo so I love that. playing around with that, you know, that typical stereotypical bond that you're used to seeing. Play around with it. I mean, that that's mm -hmm. the fun of stories, right? And that's the fun of. of having this continuation of this universe. Yeah, the know. second we're comfortable with something, subvert it in some way yeah. and, and make convince us that that is the best it could be. Like Not like the Star Wars prequels, good. but... <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Hey, that's what The Force Awakens is for. <laughs> pipe, 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 pipe. So, uh, finally, uh, we've been through a lot of things this year, but these were not the only topics of the year. We also had Bully right here mm -hmm. wonderful game by rockstar uh, one of my very favorite things one of ever their created. best games yeah absolutely mm -hmm. if not in some people's opinion their best game okami which some people argued was the best legend of that zelda game that is the game. best 3d zelda <laughs> game ever made i will i will fight anyone for that one uh this was the year of new super mario brothers which is not my favorite mario game but began something that i become a huge fan of because new super mario brothers uh wii is one of my favorite games mm. uh and uh so what happened there this was the year of snakes on a plane <laughs> oh uh, boy! Which, <laughs> another yeah, movie a, that people would not shut up for that one tagline yeah. you heard over yeah. and over and over. I have and no and idea only Samuel about Jackson <laughs> can pull that off. Uh, <laughs> my snake. <laughs> no. The Departed, <laughs> Pan's Labyrinth, which might be the scariest thing Ooh, ever committed to film. Oh um, Talladega Nights, because it gave me lots of quotes. <laughs> um, Max Brooks's World War Z book was 2006, oh, which, oh, wow. if you've watched the terrible, terrible movie, has it has nothing to do with it. You should read it right away. It's one of the best short story compilations written this century. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, literally. just treat it like a history yeah. it's, book. It's so good. Yeah, I, I really love it. And that's one of those ones where watching the movie does not prepare you in any way for the book. Is it's, well, no, it's not only is it missing yeah. things, it's just structurally completely right. different. <laughs> 2006 is the year that uh, Google bought YouTube. Um, uh -huh. And uh, yeah, hard to imagine there was a world where YouTube was <laughs> not part of Google. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and finally, in the history of things, they're not quite awesome. This was the year Pluto, for a while at least, ceased to be a planet. But oh, fortunately, things are becoming more right with the universe again in that front. So yeah. <laughs> now that we've seen the beautiful mountains of Pluto, yep. it's allowed back in. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, Pluto. We, we missed Pluto. you. We missed you so we much. You. Join us uh, next time for uh, 2007, where uh, the year that brought us things like Portal. Bioshock, Crackdown, Mario Galaxy, No Country for Old Men, I like Brian all those House, things so Hot much. Fuzz, and Mad Men. Think about it, there was a world with no Don Draper at one point. 2007, IGN's History of Awesome. Thank you for watching this episode, 2006. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Goodbye.